Welcome to our first Quills training session. As I already said, I'm Ruth Murray, the Research Facilitator at Quill. And we're going to start this first session with just a very general introduction to the Quill project and the principles that we would like you all to bear in mind when you're working on Quill. Um, so I'm going to start with sort of an overview and then Lauren Davies, who's the head of our editorial team, is going to explain in more detail how the sort of general principles that I introduce are going to be put into practice in modeling. We think the session will last about sort of 40 minutes and then there'll be an opportunity for some questions. And as I said earlier, we hope this is going to be the first of a series of online events where we highlight the best practice for building a Quill project and troubleshoot some of the common problems that people have with modeling. Each session will follow a similar format of a general introduction to a theme, followed by more specific troubleshooting of modeling issues that we've identified when reviewing projects. And we'd really welcome suggestions from you for areas that you would like to have addressed in future training. So since this is our first session, um, I thought we could go back to the very beginning. Um, so Quill is a digital humanities project based in Pembroke College and the University of Oxford. And I think many of you have already visited us here at Pembroke. And if you haven't already, hopefully you'll have an opportunity to do so in the future. The project was founded by Dr. Nicholas Cole, who visits UVU several times a year as part of our collaboration. So you will definitely have an opportunity to meet him at some point soon, even if you haven't already. Now, Nicholas originally designed Quill's bespoke software platform to assist with his own research into the US Constitutional Convention in 1787. And in the nine or 10 years since then, he's developed that initial, initial concept in partnership with a number of computer scientists. Over the years, the platforms had a number of di different iterations. And if you've been working on Quill for more than a year or two, you've probably seen a couple of those. Although I don't think there's many of us left who've modeled in Quill Mark I, fortunately, I think. <laughs> um, but we've come a long way from Nicholas's ivory tower and Quill is now very much a global project. And that's the first thing that we really want you to take away from today, that you're part of something really big, a, a big global Quill family, as it were. We now have projects and collaborations in four continents. We have major research projects in the US, as you know, but also in Australia, India, Ireland, and then a sort of variety of smaller and more exploratory um, projects and research collaborations in other places. But you guys will be very happy to know that UVU is our most enduring partnership. We've had a formal collaboration between our institutions since um, 2018, but there was informal collaboration going on before that as well. With people using Quill all around the world, it's vital that we're all working to the same standards and taking a broadly similar approach to editing. And that's what the team here in Oxford is um, here to help you with. So the Oxford team, in addition to Nicholas Cole, this is who you might meet in the Oxford office. So um, I'm Ruth Murray, I'm the research facilitator and hopefully that does what it says in the tin if you have the advert in the US as well. Um, I write grant applications and dream up new projects and partnerships for Quill and generally try to assist Nicholas with keeping the project running smoothly. Then we have Lauren Davis, um, who's responsible for setting the editorial policies and standards for all Quill projects. She'll explain a bit more about her role in a minute. The technical team is led by Martin Lewis Delgarno, our research software engineer. And we've recently appointed a second research software engineer, Alex, to work with him. And then adjacent to Martin and Alex, there's a team of visualization experts that we collaborate with at King's College London. One of those, Alfie Abdul Rahman, has worked with Nicholas since Quill began right at the beginning. So Lauren, um, Martin and I work across all the Quill projects. And then in addition to them, we've got five other editors on the team. So um, the two people that are most important for you guys are Elizabeth and Holly. 
So um, since Quill's become much bigger, we've realised how important it is that each project at external institutions should have its own editor assigned to us. Um, they work in the office with Lauren and they, oh, sorry, somebody else in the meeting room. They work in the office with Lauren and Martin and I, and they can feed back in both directions and um, make sure that all the information flow is working properly. Um, so as you know, Elizabeth and Holly are your links. And if you have any issues or concern, they should be your first point of call. Um, I imagine you're gonna have your own reporting lines within UVU. And obviously you need to <laughs> abide by those in the first instance. But um, if you need to get in touch with us in Oxford about a more general quill problem, we'd really like you to start by emailing or messaging Holly and her email address is on that slide there. Um, the reason for this is that if you message Holly, your um, query, your problem, whatever's wrong, will get logged properly in our systems and then it will get referred to Martin or Lauren or whoever needs to fix it. Um, it also means that we can track in the office problems that are coming across multiple projects. So if you bring in up, up an issue and there's a similar issue in the India project, then it helps us just to see and to track what we really need to be dealing with and thinking about and problem shooting. Um, I should also say that Holly is working full time in the office five days a week, and it's her job to make your projects the best they can possibly be. So no matter what issue you have, it's not too small, it's not too silly, just please do ask her and she, she'll be delighted to hear from you and will be really keen to try to get it solved for you as quickly as possible. And even if you think something seems a bit silly, it's almost certainly the case that if it doesn't make sense to you or it's causing problems to you, it's going to be causing problems to somebody else and they'll be struggling with it as well. So please do, don't worry about getting in touch about anything. Um, bring it to Holly and she can talk to the rest of the team if she doesn't know how to solve it herself. And we'll try to get that fixed for you. Um, but although you're going to be mainly dealing with Holly and Elizabeth, um, we just wanted you to know that the rest of the team in Oxford is also working for you and working for your projects, even if it's in a bit more of a behind the scenes way. So <laughs> we're all here and we're all kind of rooting for you and wanting all our projects to be a really great success. So that's the first thing. Remember that Quill is global. Um, the second thing that we want you to take home from today is that Quill is about a document. So all our Quill projects are about negotiated texts. We have projects in nearly every continent of the world. Some are about constitutions, some are about peace treaties, some are about international agreements or pieces of national legislation. But the thing that they all have in common is that they're about a negotiation of a text. That is, they're about a document that's been worked out through a formal process in which a group of people have come together to argue out the final wording of a legal document. So for the rest of this session, we're going to keep on repeating that word document, and we're not going to apologize for it because it's at the heart of each of our projects. As you get into the process of modeling, you have to become really details oriented, but it's really important to keep the big picture in mind as you go. Everything that you're doing is in relation to the addition or removal of text from a document. And we'd really like you to keep reminding yourself that as you work, everything you're doing is in relation to that final document. And holding that thought will help you to make better decisions in modeling, as Lauren's going to explain later. So Quill's global, Quill's about a document. And our third takeaway from today is that Quill is about the end user. Now, that might seem kind of obvious, but if you're like me, and I imagine you are a little bit if you decided to sign up to modeling in Quill, you quite like the detail and you quite like having a list and ticking things off. <laughs> And you can get quite a bit of satisfaction out of just ticking the next box or filling in the next box in the Quill platform. But um, Nicholas likes to remind us that we had 15,000 unique users in Quill last year. They will include historians, lawyers, politicians, teachers, school kids, and just general geeks. And they will have different levels of understanding when they approach Quill and different things that they want to get out to the visit. It's important that we develop different visualizations and resources to meet their different needs and to help them to access the material. 
And UVU has very much led the way in working with high school teachers. And I know some of the UVU students also had the opportunity to train some law clerks a few years ago. We really love working with UVU in this and we'll always welcome your feedback and ideas for ways we can develop features for those different kinds of groups. So if you have those kind of ideas, do please share them with us, pass those on to Holly as well. And we can talk to Martin and the Viz team and you know, see if there's any way that we can implement them. And maybe later on in the year, we'll have a session about how we can produce resources from Quill for different types of user. But today we're very much focused on the basics. And in many ways, those kind of bespoke visualizations are just the icing on the cake. There's no point in them unless we get our core job right. So as editors, our primary responsibility is to accurately and faithfully present the primary source materials. And that's where attention to detail is vital and also being completely thorough in our, our approach. So what does the end user need from us? Your job is to take the end user, whoever they are, on a journey through the source material. Um, I like to think about it as we're constructing a map. In the end, it's gonna be up to the user how they use that map. So some of the users will just use it, I don't know, you call it a freeway in the States, do you? Um, to just speed along the road and have a quick look at the landscape as they go. Other users will want to put on their hiking boots and get off the main road and see the countryside in great detail. You know, they'll join us in the subcommittees and look at all the little details along the way. And in a way that doesn't really matter. That's not for us to decide at this stage, whether they're going to be looking at the big picture or they're going to look at every twist and turn. But for us at this stage of building the project, in order to give them the map that they will need, we have to explore every single twist and turn, every step and represent it as accurately as possible. And that's why all our projects start with archival work in one form or other, whether that's hunting around in people's garages for old files and letters or consulting a nicely bound and printed journal. And that's why we can't emphasize enough how important it is for you to record your sources accurately. It's not for us as editors to make assumptions or jump to conclusions about what happened next or about what we think the, co the convention understood at a particular point in time. We have to look for the evidence, hunt for the missing documents and constantly show our workings. We can't just jump ahead because we think it's got a bit murky somewhere and hope that someone else will go on a document hunt for us. Our user doesn't want a blank section on the map. Let me give you an example for, from the last month for me. So um, I work on the Northern Ireland peace process and I was working on an exchange of documents between two people. It's a well-known part of the peace process and the conventional wisdom in the literature and the source I was initially working with suggested that there were four or five documents exchanged over a period of four months. So I hope to get this little committee sorted out in a couple of days. But one of the documents referenced other individuals and another document that weren't in the source materials I was looking at. Two archives later, one of which had some useful looking documents and no dates. I don't understand why people don't write dates and documents. And I still haven't been able to take the Hume Adams committee off my list. But the documents I've uncovered in the process are now part of the resource collections attached to this negotiation. And I find primary sources that identify the other people involved. If I'd rushed ahead so I could take the committee off my list, the Quill project would have replicated the simplistic narrative about these talks available elsewhere. By following the document trail, rather than the Wikipedia pages that were, we've added real value and offered academics who come along behind us greater access to primary source material. They can then properly evaluate the new information and assess the influence of the other people involved. It's up to them, not me, to make a judgment about whether this new information challenges the conventional wisdom about what was going on, but at least they have the information to hand to make that judgment now. So I'd encourage you, if you get to a naughty bit of the convention you're working on, don't rush ahead just so you can finish another session. Pause, you might need to stop and look for additional sources. Sometimes those might be already available in the material you've brought back from the archives. But if they're not, bring the issue to the attention of your team leaders and senior editors as soon as possible so they can make just strategic decisions about what you should be working on. It's never about just modeling the next session. It's always about carefully reading the records and going where that takes you. More on that from Lauren in a minute. And then just finally from me, something about neutrality, because that also relates to the end user. 
we all become many experts in a very niche area by working in these projects. And it's entirely normal and fine that we develop opinions about what's going on and that we have particular members of a, members of a convention that we warm to and others that we tend to cast as the villain of the piece. But we need to bear in mind that many of our end users are historians who've been working on these documents for decades in some cases. Our work will enhance their work. It will make their lives infinitely easier and save them a huge amount of time. But frankly, it's not for us to do their job for them and to make too many judgments in the material. Our job is to be accurate and thorough. This is something that I'm obviously acutely aware of working on um, peace treaties, but I think it also applies more widely across the board. Even in less explosive material, if you excuse the pun, academics might be at loggerheads over its interpretation. We don't want to be directly involved in that argument as editors. We present the sources, ring the bell, and let them get the boxing gloves out. And that's why it's so vital that we're accurate, thorough, and nonpartisan in how we present the information. It also brings us back around to the fact that we're all part of one big quill community. If I fail in my project to be accurate in my use of sources, or to write sloppy editorial notes that suggest a rush judgment, I undermine the credibility of my project. But I also threaten your project because users will make a judgment about Quill as a whole by what they discover in one project. So my takeaways, remember that it's all about a document. Remember that we're here to serve the end user by providing a comprehensive and accurate representation of the sources. And back to where we started, remember that we're part of a worldwide Quill community how we model impacts each other. I think that's really cool. Make the most of your link editors and let's try to keep our work consistent. Lauren's going to talk a bit more about how these three factors impact how we model and quill on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, so I'm going to take each one of Ruth's main takeaways and then talk about what that means for us on a practical level when we think about and actually start building quill timelines. So, Ruth mentioned this already, but it bears repeating because it is at the heart of our work at Quill, which is that our work isn't simply to reproduce existing materials or, or represent existing materials in, in, in a different format. We want to make a valuable contribution to the work that's already been done and to aid the end user. So at the most basic level, we do that by bringing together archive materials that have been sort of scattered to the wind as source materials in Quill. Um, and by using multiple source materials to create a timeline, we can provide a nuanced view of the goings on of a convention. So comparing multiple sources um, allows us as editors um, to get a better feel for the strengths and weaknesses of those materials. So for example, um, in the 1787 convention, which is one of the first projects that I worked on when I started working at Quill um, coming up on five years ago, uh, is that a comparison of Madison's notes with the convention journal demonstrates that the secretary of the convention really tried to keep the journal tidy and he would group together proposals that were similar or pertain to similar parts of the document, whereas Madison would provide a more faithful account of the sometimes messy sequence of events. But Madison, on the other hand, was, was less accurate in recording the changes to the text, and he perhaps overstated in his notes the support he received on certain proposals. And this is the sort of thing that we really wouldn't have gotten, you know, we really wouldn't have picked up on if we had only cons um, consulted one of those sources. So consulting multiple sources allows us to evaluate the materials that we're using and demonstrate what is attested to and which source. And then we can layer those source materials through additional descriptions and fill in gaps in the record. So these are all things that will aid our users. And in some cases, we're even able to collate these resources into resource collections, whether we host those documents ourselves on Quill and link them to the relevant places on the timeline, or whether we signpost people to external resources on external sites. Um, and we have a particular way that we go about gathering archive materials and organizing them so that they can be easily consulted and uploaded as resource collections. Um, but Ruth will do a session on that in, in the future. Um, so a few things, you know, a few things to keep in mind when you're modeling. Sorry, can you? Okay, yeah when you're modeling um, are what do users want or expect to see when they use a website or consult the scholarly edition of a text? 
what do you expect to encounter when you use a software for the first time? And that that isn't necessarily, you know, a, a research database that could just be anything when you go on any website. What information do you need in order to be able to navigate that? Um, what information do you need in order to follow a narrative? And then are you providing all of these things to users in the model? These are things that we're constantly thinking about at Quill. They're some of the questions that lead to Quill's unique tools and visualizations. Um, so we're going to, oops, sorry. <laughs> we're going to walk through some of these visualizations together um, so that, so if you all will go to Quill um, and pull it up beside this Zoom call and then type Q15, no, is it? Yeah, Q114 into the search box at the top, it will take you to the US Constitutional Convention, uh, the 2019 version. Right, so the first of these tools, so Quill has a number of tools and pages and we don't necessarily use these as editors, but it's important to be aware of them because the work we do on the timeline directly informs them. There are also the tools that very much have an end user in mind. So if you go to select view from this project um, on the project homepage and then click guided research tools, we will have a look at that together. All right, so I'll give you a minute. <laughs> so this view takes the information from the full record and reorganizes it by delegate, delegation, and committee. And at the top of the page, which is a relatively new feature, um, I'm sure some of you have seen it already, but just in case there are a few of you who haven't, um, at the top of the page, right under where it says U.S. Constitutional Convention 1787, um, there's two little boxes that you can click, the convention document map and the convention current document library. So users have the option to see all of the documents of a convention at once, organized by whether they were adopted, referred, or pending. Um, so that is convention document map. And then there's also the option to see what documents were created or copied on a specific day in committee. Um, and that is the convention current document library. So the guided research tools view may be useful for people who aren't necessarily interested in getting bogged down with the nitty gritty amendments but are interested in perhaps the contributions of a particular committee or individual. And as you can see, making sure our handling of documents in the timeline is as thorough and accurate as possible makes this view as useful as possible for those users. So the other day I was talking to somebody who was interested in whether a specific member of the Indian Constituent Assembly is recorded as speaking in favor of a particular issue. And this view is perfect for that sort of research interest. So she could go here, click on that delegate, and then get a list of all of the committees they participated in every, every time they spoke, every document that they had a hand in, every amendment, and so on. So that is just a brief overview of the guided research tools. Um, and if you go up to the top of your screen, you'll get a banner that looks like the one that's at the bottom of this slide. And we are going next to, sorry, I lost my place in my notes, <laughs> um, the activity summary now. So if you can get to that by clicking on the orange circle at the top. And this is a screen on, on, on Quill that is impossible to get a good screenshot of, especially when it's a very complicated negotiation, but it provides a zoomed out look at the work of the convention as a whole. And then if you scroll further down the work of a committee, and then if you scroll further down the work of a person. So this view could be interesting for users who are approaching a Quill project and trying to decide where to focus more detailed attention. So it allows for a big picture approach to the material, but it's also searchable. So users can identify the moments within the big picture view where certain topics were being discussed, and then they can zero in on, on those um, for further study. So, I will, you know, you can go in and have a look around some of these tools after this meeting if you haven't, you know, done so already. I know, like Ruth said, some of you have been here for a while, so this may not be new for you. 
Um, but the next uh, view that we're going to look at is topic overview. So if you go back to the top of to the ribbon at the top of your screen and you click on the green circle in the top banner, it will take you to something that looks like this. So this view is probably like something you've seen before. It's I mean, it's essentially a word cloud. It shows all of the projects kind of keywords. So when you select one word, the events that are relevant to that keyword populate below. And this is another way of allowing users to approach the major topics they might be interested in. Um, and moving on from there, we go to voting statistics. So again, going up to the banner, if you click on the light blue circle with the little, it looks like a bar graph in it, um, that will take you to something that looks like this. This tool um, is really cool. It allows you to identify voting alliances based on the voting records that you have entered into Quill. So you can select a committee a voting type, so whether by person or delegation, you can do a specific document or you can just do an overview and you can select two time samples to compare. So not only can you see who voted which way on a particular document, but by comparing different time samples, you can see how alliances shifted from the beginning of a convention, say, to the end. Um, observing a shifting alliance leads to interesting opportunities for further research. I read a paper a few years ago by some data scientists who did this work manually on the 1787 convention, where, as many of you know, the common narrative is very much that there was a major tension between big and small states. But by identifying three distinct voting periods during the convention that were characterized by different alliances and centered around contentious issues, these researchers hypothesize that the big versus small states narratives is perhaps a bit overstated and that the real tension in the convention had more to do with the opposition between Madison and Sherman, both of whom were delegates from large states. And I'm not here to say whether that is correct or incorrect. Uh, it's just an interesting observation from, you know, a quantitative analysis of material that has been largely studied from a qualitative perspective. Point of view. So what I'm trying to get at here is one of my least favorite parts about modeling and quills entering voting records. I mean, I truly hate it. It takes so much time, especially when there are tons of delegates. But this tool is a really good uh, demonstration why diligently entering the voting records is really important because you can you can see patterns like this when you do so. So the next place we're going is the full record view. So you can get to that by clicking on the gray circle on the top banner. Um, and with this view, we'll talk a little bit more about our user focus, and then we'll move on to our document focus. So um, as this view is the one that we work from, you're probably really familiar with it. Um, I just wanted to point out a few tools and, um, and pieces of information that are useful not only to users, but to you as you model. And some of these are relatively new as well, so you may or may not have seen them before. So one of them is this chronological list of sessions across all committees that you can access by clicking. So if you go underneath this sort of visualization that shows all of the sessions of all the committees in relationship to one another, underneath that, there's some text you can click on that says all committee sessions. And if you click on that, it shows you a chronological list, chronological by both date and time. So you um, this can help you as while you're modeling make sure that documents are being handed between committees chronologically or that committee sessions are occurring in the correct order so one thing that i think is kind of easy to do when we're doing quill is say we come across a committee and we don't know what time they met and so we just say oh okay they met at midnight whatever um and then we take a document from the, from a convention session that happens on that same day, but say we know it happens at 10. And the convention refers a document to that committee on that day. If you look at it in this view right here, it looks like that document is going backwards in time because it's going from, say, 10 a.m. on July 15th to midnight on July 15th. So, I mean, it's 
it's one of these things that can can help you as you're entering, but it also as you're entering the data, but it also helps readers approach the material um, in a more fluid, logical way rather than going, okay, I will go and look at the convention now. And I will now I will go and look at the committee of detail or whatever. Um, so quill tools and visualizations aside. There's a lot of work that we have to do as editors to ensure that a user is getting all the information that they need to understand the material. So the screenshot on the left shows a committee session with three events, and each one is a document copied from the convention. If you look at the screenshot on the top right, it shows a description that somebody provided to describe one of these copied documents. And it just says referred to committee on state, school, and granted lands. The only information that it provides is that the document was referred to the committee. It doesn't say anything about what the document is, why it's being referred, et cetera. So if a user were to click on this specific committee session, so to say they went straight to the committee on state, school, and granted lands and clicked on this day, and rather than following the narrative from the convention and then being led to the committee from the convention, they really wouldn't get a good idea of what's happening. Um, they, they, they would see a document here, but that's all they know. So we really need to think about that. We need to keep the narrative in mind when we're, we're providing information to users. So if you look at the bottom screenshot, this was an edit that was done after the fact. So it has the same quote at the bottom, referred to state school granted lands, but it just provides a little bit more contextual information for those users who are coming specifically to this committee rather than being routed through the convention. So the following propositions were then submitted in the following order and read the first time, talks about the proposition, you know, eliminates a bit of text um, with some ellipses which is, don't misunderstand me, I'm not saying to eliminate text from the records while you're modeling. This was, um, that text is modeled in the convention, but just for this particular event in this committee, it wasn't. So we're able to provide more information. It gives readers and users just a, a better idea of what's going on. So what I'm trying to say is that when I'm modeling Something I like to keep in mind is, am I providing an intelligible narrative? And the same thing goes with editor's notes. So do your editor's notes sufficiently explain what's going on, the editorial decisions or inferences that you're making, the resources you've consulted and so on? You know, um, there are some moments where it is appropriate to use a kind of stock editor's note, but... I would say most of the time, you know, we really need to make sure that when we're backing up every claim that we make with source material. So does the and and then further to that, um, does the citation you've provided in the source details or in your editor's notes allow a user to locate the text you're citing in real life? Can they go to the archive where you've gotten a scan of that document? and find the exact box, page, folder, paragraph, you know, et cetera. So um, this leads us to our document focus. It's really easy to think about a quill timeline as a number of boxes to tick off. And it is so easy to get tied up in filling those boxes that we lose sight of the big picture. So ideally, modeling in Quill is a constant back and forth between the big picture and the nitty gritty. And that is nowhere more important than in our modeling of documents. And um, as Ruth said earlier, Quill is all about the document. It's all about the negotiated text, how they're written and amended and debated to arrive at their final iteration. So on a zoomed out or a, sorry, a zoomed in level, we want to be absolutely sure that the document, when a document events are created, the correct text with no typos is being added. So making typos in these documents early on can cause problems down the line. We also need to make sure that we're faithfully reproducing documents when it comes to things like intentional formatting decisions. So, you know, all caps are uh, intentional line breaks, formatting things, um, but also archaic spellings. And, oh, sorry. And we need to 
really make sure that we're making every effort to find the text of documents that appear in the records. So like Ruth said, um, skipping over parts of the model and hoping that the right document will turn up later isn't the best approach. It's much better to spend extra, extra time trying to hunt these documents down than to skip over them for the sake of finishing faster. Ruth's example about how taking time to find a document has shed a new light on our understanding of a particular moment in the Ireland Project is one of many examples like it. Um, and I'm going to give you one of my own from the India Project that I've been working on. So this screenshot gives a similar example from that project. So the text on the left is a text of a document as agreed in a committee. So the committee takes up the document section by section, clause by clause. Um, they amend it and they, they go through all of the clauses and they arrive at the version of the text that you see on the left. Um, however, the document appears when it's reported in a very different form. <laughs> And we see that on the right. And if we hadn't taken the time to hunt down all of the various, like the um, the multiple versions of this document and compare them line by line, word by word, we would have missed out on a really interesting finding, which is what you see on the right here. Um, and that is that there were a number of very substantial decisions that were made off stage, so to speak. And it really demonstrates how much power the Constituent Assembly's constitutional advisor had to make unilateral decisions about text under discussion, or sorry, text that was not under discussion, text that had already been agreed. So if, yeah, like I said, if we hadn't taken the time to consult those various versions of the document, we would have missed this entirely. So this is just one of many examples um, about how Quill is not just a representation of existing materials. It provides a rich platform for examining our understanding of these documents. Um, so continuing on with our document focus, we're going to take a look at the calendar view. So you go to that by clicking on the kind of reddish circular icon with the calendar on it. And you get something that looks like this. So this visualization is created with the data from all copy and refer events that you create within a project. And it provides an overview of how documents move through committees. So this is an important element of how these documents are written and who had a hand in them. And we wanna make sure that we're presenting an accurate picture. In other words, we should make sure that correct versions of documents are being copied and referred and that we're not unnecessarily duplicating documents in the timeline. So that means paying attention to phrases like Mr. X moved the resolu the resolution that had been laid on the table. So, you know, that had been laid on the table indicates that even though you might be reading about this document for the first time, it already exists in the no negotiation and should have been created in a previous session. So you don't need to create it again. Um, another thing that I mean about taking a zoomed out approach to modeling is simply to check your work as you're working. When you add an amendment to a document, take a step back and check the highlight changes tab on the document text to make sure that you've added it correctly. Use the related events tab in the clock icons to make sure that you've referred and copied the correct versions of documents into the correct places. Um, it, as, as I'm sure you know, finding versions of documents that have been copied and referred from the wrong places to the wrong places is really, really difficult to fix. So you, you also may have noticed that these things that I'm mentioning now are all things that relate to a user's experience of the model as well. So I'm going to move on now to Ruth's last point, which is that we are all part of a worldwide community. So why is it important that Quill projects across the world use the same standards? There are a few reasons. And since most of us are American and I've been watching the baseball postseason, I'll give you a sports metaphor. Each Quill partner and each partner project is like a player on a team. And those of you who played sports have probably heard the phrase that we all win and lose together. And that is very true of Quill. Ruth touched on it earlier, but when when we do well, we do well. And if one of us, you know, maybe doesn't do so well, then we all don't do so well. Um, the second reason, which is a, a bit more lighthearted, I guess, um, is 
it relates to user experience again. When somebody comes to our platform and accesses one project, they learn a sort of quill language. So the, the event icons are like parts of speech. And as the user reads their project, they learn how and when those parts of speech are applied. And they if they then go to another project that uses those same parts of speech in a vastly different way, then the model fails. It doesn't perform in the way that it should. A user of one pro Quill project should be able to read and understand every other project. The third reason is comparability. Um, so those of you who've been with Quill for a while have probably noticed that the U.S. state constitutions borrow from each other quite a bit. Sometimes a convention will copy entire passages into their constitution from another state's constitution. But this isn't a phenomenon that's limited to the U.S. states. So the Indian Constituent Assembly, I've, uh, I have included a screenshot. Yeah, this one at the bottom. They considered incorporating provisions from the U.S., Swiss, Irish, USSR, Australian, and Weimar constitutions, just to name a few. The Washington State Convention, which is up here in uh, the screenshot at the top, considered incorporating provisions from the Australian Constitution, and the Australian Constitution talked a lot about including elements from the Swiss Constitution. So comparative constitutional law is a really growing field of study, especially as our you know, world becomes increase increasingly global. So we want to create our models in a way that researchers, teachers, legal practitioners can compare one negotiation with another. And lastly, following common standards makes it easier for all of us. Um, if we don't have to come up with new solutions for problems that somebody else has already encountered and come up with solutions for, then that saves us time and energy. So to summarize, it's all about the document. We're servants of the end user and you're part of a worldwide Quill community. This was just an overview of what, of kind of the things that we'll be getting into in future sessions. Mm -hmm.